this uh, broadcast from Southern California here at Ridley Engineering. My name is Ray Ridley and I'll be talking to you for the next hour. Hope everything is good with sound video. Please send questions if you have anything, concerns. We have plenty of people here to answer you. And uh, this is probably one of the biggest gatherings of uh, power electronics engineers uh, for a long time. Over 500 of you already in the room here. And I'm not going to do a big introduction of myself, because I think you know who I am, Ray Ridley. Uh, really nice to see lots of my friends from the group, Power of Spy Design Center group online. Welcome. Some of you being camped out since about 7.30 this morning. So hope, uh, hope it's all good. What I'm going to talk about today is magnetics essentials. And everybody has a different idea what the essentials of magnetics are. Uh, I've been working with magnetics for, uh, gosh, I think 40 years now since I wound my first transformer. And uh, many of the methods I have and techniques I have are not, are not common in the industry. The people who come to our workshops certainly learn about them. But we've, we've, we've come out with methods of designing magnetics, testing magnetics, qualifying magnetics for production. And uh, I'm going to share some of those things with you. So, Something to learn if we have any managers out there is that magnetics are the key to power supplies working. And the power supplies are key to something much bigger working. So let me let me go back in history a little bit to my, my very first, oh, I'm sorry, that's the next slide. Questions we're gonna try and answer in the slide and raise for you that are very important and becoming more important these days are, you know, who owns the design of the magnetics? Is that yours? Is that your magnetics vendor? Who's in control of the design? Who knows all the build details? How magnetics are built? We'll, we'll do some examples here. We'll make some measurements to show you why that is so important in today's world. Who makes the prototypes? Do you build your own prototypes? Do you depend on a magnetics vendor to do that for you? Or do you use a combination of both, which is what we do? But you know, when, when time is tight, and we need to make a new transformer for a flyback or forward or something, we need it now. We can't wait two weeks, three weeks, and we know how to make our own prototypes. Taking the fingerprints of a transformer, this is something that most people don't do. I've always assumed that everybody does this because I've always done it, but uh, it turns out that it's not, not quite as common as I thought it was. Many of you do, but it's certainly not a standard in the industry that uh, we hope to change some of it. Ensuring build quality and repeatability. Talk some more about that as we go through. And the magnetics, if it's not managed properly, this can be the weak link of many, many complex systems. It can be very expensive if you don't handle the magnetics properly. Let's go back a little bit. My very first project, 1991, was a 10,000 amp circuit breaker. Now, I don't know how to make a 10,000 amp circuit breaker. I'm certainly uh, in admiration of those that do. And uh, very serious power out there. People do even more power than this. But a uh, company came to me uh, because they knew me through a friend at school uh, at Boston University. And they, uh, they needed a power supply for their 10,000 amp circuit breaker. And even though they knew how to deal with 10,000 amps, they weren't so good at dealing with just half an amp. And we, we find there's a very different separation of the high power people and the, you know, people that do switching power supplies. So inside this 10,000 amp breaker, there's a little 12 watt interlock power supply. One right here on my, my bench. So if you can see that, I still have this in my archives. And that goes inside the unit. And the function of this is to pull in a solenoid, which then enables the handle to be cranked for the 10,000 amps to be closed. And then inside that power supply are the magnetics. And this is a custom flyback transformer. And I know this transformer intimately even after 30 years because I spent many, many weeks working on the arrangements of the windings of this transformer. And at the end of the project, the intricacies of the winding arrangements inside that small transformer enabled the functioning of a 10,000 amp circuit breaker. If those windings weren't put in the right place, the 
the breaker wasn't going to work. That's really important. And I know, I know many of you who are in our Pass By Design Center group run into these things. You discover something in the magnetics that makes everything work. And then that becomes the secret sauce for this. So again, the question comes, do you know what's in your magnetics? Whoever's making it for you, do you know that that's enabling your whole system to work properly? Okay, what I'm gonna do now is something a little nerve wracking for me. Hopefully it's more interesting for you as attendees. So we're not we're gonna just do PowerPoint. I'm gonna run some software for you. So I've taken a little risk here. Hopefully it all works out. We're gonna do a little 12 watt flyback design. And the design of this flyback is not the point of the presentation here. It's just to show you the process we go through in um, doing a design, you know, getting ready for production. And we've written a program that everybody gets who comes to our workshop for designing very quickly. And you just basically put in low line voltage, nominal voltage, high line voltage, the output voltage that you want, and the output current that you want from your design. And then you click OK. This is a little 12 watt flyback. It's not the same one that I showed from my example in 1991, but uh, similar kind of approach. 100 kilohertz design, click OK. And then we're gonna choose a flyback converter here, which is what we've got. Now our design program, we immediately go to looking at things like waveforms. So since we're looking now at transformer design, here's our transformer getting up and started, the steady state. And we look at the secondary current waveform is right here. And then that is the secondary waveform. So that defines our winding currents for our transformer. And what we have now at this point, how it literally goes that quickly, just within a minute, is the first level design of a transformer. And this is what I call a schematic level design. So it's a turns ratio, a primary inductance, primary resistance, and a secondary resistance. And it's operating at 100 kilohertz. And that's my schematic level design. You can put that into LT Spice, whatever your favorite simulator is, and you can make your circuit run. You can also jump back to PowerPoint for a minute here. You can also give these parameters, the switching frequency, the current limit, and the waveforms, you can give those to a manufacturer at this point. And a good qualified manufacturer will be able to build you a transformer from this. However, this is not a specification for a transformer. This is the minimum information that a good vendor would need to design the transformer for you. But this is not enough information to recreate that transformer if something goes wrong. If your vendor goes out of business, hopefully they aren't, but you have to worry about those things these days. You've got to worry about continuity of your product. So having this data about your transformer is not enough to guarantee that. And it's also not enough to debug a failing power supply. You can meet all these specs on this schematic level design. Transformer comes in, meets the specs. It may or may not work. We will see. And uh, this is typically what you get when you buy an off-the-shelf flyback transformer. They will give you these details. The inductance, turns ratio, resistances, leakage inductance, and so on. And that's just a very fundamental starting point for beginning the design. This is not a full spec on a magnetic. Okay, let's go in and go a little deeper in design. So let's try to turn this more into a full spec of how we're going to make a magnetic. Click on transformer design here. And again, this is not the point of the presentation, it's to get us to some hardware quickly. Turns the core. Let's use an EPC-19 core. The area is this. Here's our inductance that we're going to use, one millihenry, primary turns, secondary turns. All of this design process is automated for you in the program here. Tells you a little bit about the gap, it's a seven mil gap, 0.18 millimeters, is the AL value of the core. And then we get to the core material is here. And we can select different core materials, 
FPNR for megging, Perx cube, GDK. We can use different core materials. We can look at different core losses for these different core materials. So this is the next step of our design. We, we, we did the basic design of turns ratio, resistances, and inductance. Now we're diving in and actually choosing the core, the material, the winding is our primary winding, the 86 turns, it's a lot of turns, we're going to stack them up in two layers, 31 gauge wire, and the loss is going to be about 1.2 ohms according to the sheet. So that's our primary, and our secondary is going to be 16 turns, 22 gauge wound on top of the primary. So now we've penetrated down to the next level of the design. Okay, so what we have, go to the schematic, do our design summary and look at transformer details. Here's the next level of design. First level is schematics only, next level is now the details of building something. So we've got a one millihenry inductor, we've got the core type, which is EPC19, the core area, the gap, the current limit, the turns, 86 primary, 16 secondary, wire size is 31 in the primary and 22 on the secondary. This is another jumping off point, if you like, for handing this design over to your vendor. You say, okay, this is how I want my transformer built. I've done some simulations of this. I know exactly what my resistance is going to be. Please go make this transformer for me, or you can make the transformer yourself at this point. So that's our second level design of the transformer. And let me do my presentation here for a minute. That's this page we've gone through. There's the summary of our component level design. Everything you need to give to the manufacturer. And then what we have here, and if you can zoom in the picture of me here, these are the parts that make a successful transform. Okay, so we have a core, whoops, on here. We have some primary winding, secondary winding, and a bobbin on here. The yellow bits there, that's not just color, that's the tape we're gonna use, and that's the tape to hold the core together. So that's all the parts you need to make a transform. Oh, and don't forget these two little bits here. I don't know if you can see that, the two little dots on the page here. That's the gap to the core. If you don't put those in, your power supply doesn't work, and your 10,000 amp circuit breaker doesn't work. So that gets a little disconcerting to some project managers who see the couple of bits of paper, all the difference between success and failure of their complex system, but that's the way it works. So, is this enough? To define a transformer now, we have the turns, turns ratio certainly, the primary, the secondary, all the bits that we need, somebody can hand them to you. These are nine simple pieces to make a transformer. Is this enough detail to guarantee success of a design? Like, no, it's not. We're still not quite there at this point. And uh, just for the seminar, I like winding transformers. I thought I'd wind some transformers. So here are five different transformers that were made for this particular testing. There's five different ways to, to wind, to arrange just the primary winding. So here's number one, number two, number three, number four, and number five. That's five different ways to wind the primary that I came up with. Three of them work well, two of them don't. The one that's the easiest to manufacture is not going to work well and it may or may may not stop your power supply from working so what do i mean by that well we're going to take one of these transformers now let's start with this first one and we'll define what i mean by working well here and we're going to close this down go back to our design program and we're going to go to frequency response response analyzer and we're going to take the transformer, got a couple of leads here on the primary. And hook this up. 
to measure it. Oops. Okay, and now we're going to sweep. Sweep initiated. We're going to sweep the impedance of the prime ray of the transformer. And by the way, what you have here while that's sweeping, this is our control panel for our frequency response analyzer. I think it's probably the first frequency response analyzer that talks to you. Uh, we do find that people have frequency response analyzers in the lab and they don't remember how to use them. So as talks to you and lets you know, shows you little pictures of how to set up. So now we're sweeping here. This is our impedance of the transformer. This is great sweeping impedances, but if you don't have a comparison to what it's supposed to do, it's kind of hard to read it. So let's jump back into our design program, go to the transformer design, and go to the primary impedance. And here you can see our predicted primary impedance is in blue, and now our measured primary impedance is in purple. And you can see the reading of the inductor value is just above one millihenry which is what we want. So that's a reading taken at 100 kilohertz. That would be the spec from the manufacturer. And then after you've swept past that 100 kilohertz point, you can see there's a resonant peak here. It's a bit lower than we were anticipating from the predictions. Let me just update this for a minute. And you can see our capacitance primary to primary is just 40, 44 picofarads, which is which is pretty reasonable. Even the resonance is not too bad. And um, so that's our inductive value. Now, what concerns me, I, I, I always do these plots on a transformer. So if ever we do a consulting job, the first thing I do is I get at least six transformers and I will sweep this impedance curve. And DC resistance is fine. Inductive value is fine. Resonant frequency, even that too is fine actually, because nothing happens at the resonant frequency. But what what concerns me on this particular design is that right here you see a resonant dip so the frequency there is at 5.5 um, megahertz there's a big dip in the impedance of the transformer and that dip is going to define the frequency at which your primary currents are going to ring so if you're building a little flyback you slam a switch onto it you're going to see a five megahertz ringing on this particular transformer and it's going to be quite large this is only 40 db that's 100 ohms there if you hit it with uh, 250 volts it's going to be a substantial ringing at that frequency so i don't really like this transformer and this is my first transformer so this is the one that given the choice many students many manufacturers would do because it's a winding that starts on one side goes across the bobbin goes back again. It's the easiest thing to automate in production. So we don't like that one very much. Let's go back to our analyzer and look at the next one. Transformer number one, transformer number two, you can't see any difference. Let's put that one in the circuit. To test. We'll save data set one. We'll call that the outback winding right there. And now we'll sweep again. Sweep initiated. And you can see so far lying right on top of the red curve. So you can't see any difference because they're both gapped to the same inductance. Uh, is that sweep counter going along here? Still no difference. And now you start seeing the two deviating from each other. And you can see our second transformer has a much better resonant frequency on it. Much, much happier with that one. But it's still got this resonant dip. But the resonant dip has moved from five and a half megahertz out to 
13 megahertz in this case, but it's still going to ring at that frequency. What does that ringing mean? It may false trigger your current sense. It will cause EMI for that. So that's transformer number two. Let's save that one. And this is an out back winding again with tape. Save. The difference between these two transformers is one layer of tape between primary and secondary. Nothing shows up unless you measure this and you look at these dips moving here. So all these characteristics, this is what I'm looking for when I assess a transformer design to see how well it's doing. I'd like to get rid of the dip. Can I do that? Well, let's try. Here's transformer number. We'll go with number four. It's similar to three. See any difference? No, no difference. <laughs> Looks the same. We'll put this one in here. And now we're going to sweep again. Sweep initiated. And it'll take a little while to show up. But you see what we're doing here. We're collecting a set of data with different designs that we've done. Over here, we're comparing the sweep with the prediction. The prediction does not show any of these dips. It just shows, you know, the main. You look at the capacitance of the second one. Second capacitance with that tape in there dropped from 40 picofarads to 10. That makes me happy. Go back here again. Busy sweeping the third transformer. No difference between them whatsoever. So if you're testing your transformer with an LCR meter, whatever method you use, and if you're not sweeping the full frequency, you will not see a difference between these transformers. Most manufacturers do not do these sweeps. Most users and designers of transformers do not do these sweeps. So they never get to a good design because they can't see the differences. Now look at this one. Shift it a little bit more. And there's no dip in this one. That's data set three. And I call that one my RF one. Oops. And spell. Save. There's my yellow one. Not a big shift in resonance, but almost 20 dB better in terms of the lowest impedance out here. That's going to make a big difference to the EMI of this uh, of this design. And what is RF wound? That's where you wind in segments. There's no tape in there, but you wind a little bit of winding back and forth on two layers. Then the next section of winding, then the third section of windings. It's a little bit awkward to wind that by hand. You can get machines that automate that. So we're going to do one more transformer that doesn't need that technique which is my number five here. Can't see any difference from your end. And I didn't label my primary and secondary. I'll work that out. On the fly here, there's my primary secondary. Okay, sweep one more time. Initiated. So what we've done here, we've taken this kit of parts and we've arranged them differently. Put in a little bit more tape, that's all, and rearrange the way we adjust that primary in the transformer. So transformers number the blue and the red have a good chance of causing a problem in our power supply. Blue one might work. Red one, definitely not. Yellow one is going to be a nice transformer. It's going to be the lowest EMI, highest probability of success in our design. Let's see. Just about to see the purple curve here coming in. And we're sweeping out. Resonant frequency has gone down a little bit from the yellow, but it's still close. But again, on this one, there's no dip in here. Sweet, don't have that dip, don't have that dip. So that fifth transformer again is a nice way to wind this one. That one I'd be comfortable with. How is that wound? 
one layer across, layer of tape, second layer across, same direction, layer of tape before the secondary. So same amount of parts in there, just rearranged differently. These subtleties make a big difference in the performance of your system. Okay, let's go to presentation for a minute, get myself back on track. So, different assembly variations are going on here. Got four or five different transformers that well. Now, now in terms of prototyping, when you're going through the lab and you have a problem with transformer number one or transformer number two, even if you've got a really good vendor, you explain to them you need something different, you're looking at least a week. If you're a big company, you know, maybe in a week they'll get back to you. We're talking about winding these five transformers within two hours. So we're all under pressure to perform quicker these days, get our designs done quicker. And that's the point of being able to run these prototypes yourself. So what we've done here is taken a little fingerprint of our transformer, which is that open circuit measurement. That's the first thing that we do. And I know many of you do this kind of unofficially, or you've learned this, or low frequency motors often get these sweeps done on them. The next thing we want to do is the short circuit measurement on our transformer. So let's go ahead and do that. And we go back to our analyzer again. And then we're going to take our secondary, short the two windings together. Actually, I'm going to use a different transformer here because I haven't got a good short on that one. Let me take my primary, secondary, short the windings on the secondary, and then pick them up. Okay. And sweep one more time. Sweep initiated. Okay. So we can see the sweep right at the beginning here because it's different when you shorting the secondary is a little bit higher resistance at low frequencies. Sounds kind of funny, you short a turn and the resistance goes up. That's what happens in the transformer, it's kind of weird. Now we see our impedance stays low because we're dealing with leakage inductance instead of magnetizing inductance. And then it starts to rise right here. Uh, short circuit and on the short circuit measurement we really care about the resonant frequency because that's our power bandwidth you see the way it rolls off there you can't you can't push anything beyond 10 megahertz through this okay and that's okay you know these, these ones here didn't matter quite so much but now there's our short circuit pins okay great Let's go compare to predictions. And here they are. Update the measurement. 15 microhenries of inductance. We expected a little bit lower than that. But we're going to have to dive in a little bit and look at this a bit more now. Look at these two curves here. You've got the green curve and the purple curve, which is the measured. And something that's really quite interesting is that the purple curve is not the same slope as the green curve. So this is supposed to be an inductor, and the slope of an inductor when you sweep the impedance is a plus one slope. But you can see we don't actually achieve that here. Let's go back to the analyzer again, see what's going on. So you can see this family of curves we're collecting here. Wealth of information here for me, for you too, once you start learning how to read this. Let's clear all of that. Let's click on this button here. Hopefully you can hear this. Use this test setup to measure leakage inductance. Remember to short the secondary. Okay, tells you what to do, shows you the test setup to hook up here, even reminds you to short your secondary. And now we're going to sweep again. Sweep initiated. Now, when I'm evaluating the actual value of an inductor, I start at 10 kilohertz. There's no point measuring it at one kilohertz. You cannot resolve 
leakage inductance out of the DC value at, at one kilohertz. That's where most LCR meters work. So we start at 10 kilohertz, that's one tenth of the switching frequency, and we sweep through up to and beyond the switching frequency, the converter. So what do we see here? This is now reading the inductance in microhenrys right here. Let's go move that cursor over. And it starts out at 17 microhenrys at 10 kilohertz. Then we go to the switching frequency. And at the switching frequency, it's 15 microhenrys. Keep going out further. We see at one megahertz, it's 12 microhenrys. So this is not something you'll see on a data sheet from a manufacturer that the leakage inductance of a transformer is moving with frequency. And this is really important to you as a circuit designer because, well, which, which value of leakage do you, do you use? Well, if you're designing a snubber that's going to be ringing at 10 megahertz, you kind of need to know this lowest value here, right in there. We have to discount these parts here because there's a resonance going on. So 11 microhenries is what you would use to design your snubber. Maybe that value there at 100 kilohertz is what you would use to estimate your dissipation. Maybe you'd use that one inside LT Spice. I don't know, but the, the leakage changes with frequency. And that's really important because we're going to use this measurement later to qualify our magnetics. But if you just say, okay, our worst case leakage here was 18, and you're a manufacturer, you say, well, let's double that to make sure everything we make is good. That doesn't begin to capture whether that magnetic has been wound properly. Okay, so this is a crucial measurement to make to ensure that we're, um, we're, we're winding these repeatedly from one, one design to another. Okay, so that's my third measurement I always make on a transformer. Just looking back here is, we did an open circuit, a short circuit. Then, crucial to me, is leakage versus frequency, okay? Because there's a wealth of information in here, again, about what's going on, how well it's wound. Why does leakage drop? Because of proximity effects. So if you're seeing this curve dropping, that means somewhere around this frequency, before the switching frequency, Proximity effects are shifting the currents flowing in the wires, moving them closer together, which is what lower leakage is all about. So that's what we're looking for here. How is it wound? Does, if it drops, does that mean a bad transformer? No, it doesn't. It just means that proximity loss exists. It's not getting hot. Don't worry about it. One measurement left to make is primary to secondary capacitance. So what we do to do that is we short the primary leads together. It's a bit tricky with my lead links here. We've already got our secondary shorted, like so. And we're gonna put them back up. Ah. Just want to get in. I told you this one was tough. Good. Okay. Last measurement, we'll go back to magnetics impedance again. Is this set up to measure magnitude and phase of magnetics impedance? And click OK. We'll do a sweep, sweep on that initiated. one. So right now, we're just sweeping at the limits of this particular analyzer, somewhere around 110 dB. It's pretty good. And then when the impedance of the cap drops below that 100 dB level, 110 dB, we will start seeing the capacitance. Hopefully that's connected. I think it is. And there we go. 
you start seeing that coming down now at high frequencies. Okay, so this is the capacitance of my transformer from primary to secondary. Most designers, when they're first getting on flybacks, they'll make sure their magnetizing is right, they'll make sure their leakage is right, they work really hard on their leakage. When you've been doing this for many, many years, you understand capacitance is what kills you. Capacitance, primary to secondary, that's all about EMI, it's about common mode EMI, that's what really hurts in a design. So let's save that data set. It's primary, secondary, sec, capacitance. Save that. And just for good measure, we'll measure a capacitor. This is a 47 picofarad cap going in right here. Okay, let's measure again. One more sweep. And we see again the open circuit coming in at low frequencies. It's a bit noisy down here because there's no, uh, there's basically nothing to the analyzer to measure. Sweeping along. And there you go. That's 47 picofarads there. So right just below the transformer capacitance, primary to secondary. Now remember our primary to, sec primary to primary capacitance on this design was quite low, it was around 10 picofarads. Primary to secondary is about 44 picofarads on this design. Okay, so we can save that data set. Let's make that data set three. 47 picofarads. Okay. That just gives you a reference of whether you see how nice and capacitive the physical structure is compared to a real capacitor coming in here. Okay, so what do we have now? Go back to our transformer fingerprints. For me, this is a full set of data curves for a transformer. You're going to measure open circuit, gain, and phase. Short circuit, gain, phase. Leakage versus frequency. So this is the same data as here in the short circuit, but you're plotting it just from 10 kilohertz to the maximum and watching the leakage change versus frequency. And then the final measurement on the transformer is the primary to secondary capacitance. And that's reference to 47 picofarads. Okay, to me, whoops, to me, this is, full set of curves that are needed to qualify a design. Now this is kind of neat information because it is not possible to wind that magnetic with those parts and reproduce these curves unless you put all the parts in the right place. And that's what we're getting at here. We've got to make sure our vendors are reproducing what we did in a prototype. We've got to make sure they're doing it from pre-production, production, spot check a couple of years later are you still getting these same curves if you're in aerospace design i've heard crazy stories of you know nasa will go in and they'll x-ray the part to make sure all the windings are in the right place there's another approach x-raying is expensive that's why a transformer costs you ten thousand dollars if you measure these curves you're pretty much guaranteed that things have been wound the way you want them um, if you're doing really high rel part, you put a spec on these curves, make it plus or minus one dB on each of these measurements. If it's outside that, that spec, throw them away. They're not good enough for you. Does anybody do this for me? No. Have I ever gotten a vendor to sweep these for me and send me the data? No. Do I do this? Every time. So I will get in a collection of parts from Datatronics, Worth, whoever, I'll sweep these curves, and they're really very repeatable. They're very good. I wish they did give me the data, save me the work of doing it myself. But um, this is very valuable information. I can look at these curves. I've been doing this for 40 years, and I can tell you what things you might change in that design if you're having problems when you put the uh, magnetic into your circuit. Okay. 
What about construction details that are important to me? Okay. This is a long list. We've got the transformer core and body. We want the type of core. We want the material. I want the vendor and I want the gap. So I typically work with TDK, Mag Inc, you know, top vendors, Philips, Ferris Cube. They all get buy, keep buying each other and selling each other. So I, I don't know who owns what anymore. But you work with a top tier vendor and you know what you're getting. If your purchasing comes along and says, hey, we found another vendor for that core you're using and they put it in there, you've got to test it. Probably your purchasing is not going to tell you they put it in there. They're just going to do it. But it's very important. If somebody says they've got the same part as a TDK core, it's not true unless you go and measure and you see the core, core loss rise is exactly the same. Okay, that's the kind of thing you're looking for. So I need this for my design. All this information on the core and bobbin. I've even had cases where somebody changed the bobbin material or failed because it got too thin and it caught winding getting too close to the part. So you have to get about this. The winding diagrams. The number of turn air gauge. Something new enough. Vendors, they don't want turns because the secret use your part because I so sample in count it worked not hadn't given us that project engineer went to transformer so um i said to them well we have two choices here i can get one of your transformers and break it apart and uh, count the turns which is going to kind of annoy me a little bit or you could tell me what the turns are it's not hard to get the turns count on that but it's more it's more important than that if you this transform crucial to your project this is crucial to your so you have ten thousand you can't get the number on this how do you know it's not things change and it doesn't work anymore so you know this is a battle of getting full details on this versus you know the vendor wants to keep his design proprietary and better work out you know there's good vendors out there will take care of you properly and do this but treat them well of course we need to know exact layout of winding so four transformers i wound i need to know wind the primary start here stop here put a layer of tape on Spec the type of the thickness of the tape the vigor of the tape Ridiculous, they have to. And then you, you define how that's going to be wound. Same. So, when I am buying for a critical application, so who's making the wire? Which, again, is who doesn't really. Us. So, if you want the thermal, then it doesn't work. What what kind of plus or minus five percent? I want leakage plus or minus fifteen percent at ten times the switching frequency. I do not accept a leakage max. That is no good to me for quality control because they'll take the worst case leakage they see, maybe increase it fifty percent. And that means you've lost all quality control from the leakage number. So they can wind plus or minus 15%. It's not a problem. And then you've got quality control. You have to tighten up their specs a little bit. They'll do that for you. I want to see the first resonance plus or minus 15%. Again, they like to specify, the vendors like to specify the first resonance 
tests as a minimum, which means they could totally windings somewhere else and it's somewhere anymore. They keep it in the same place. That's fifteen percent. Assembly of the barber glue it together. How are you gonna is it tape, is it glue, whatever, what's the temperature? And then for me, I kind of given up of getting this from the uh, vendors at this point, so I'll always do this myself, is a full set of curves. Open circuit, short circuit, leakage versus frequency, and capacitance. So that's my full set on knowing I've got full control of this, uh, of this part. When I make these transformer measurements, okay, well, the initial design winding experimentation using these curves properly, I transform as design properly. So let's go back to a flyback supply. Flyback. I'm up to assembly variation. Minimize these curves. And I would work harder to curve out a little bit more. I don't really want it down that low. So I would definitely work on that. Okay. So these I use, these curves are used intensively during the design process. You can find where the bugs are and you can ensure repeatability. Then I will hand those curves to the vendor. Hopefully they can work with them. Most don't, some can. And when my first, first vendor prototypes come in, you know, so you're going to wait a month for these probably, you're going to compare curves. Did they reproduce my curve? And when those first vendor prototypes come in, you know, you compare the curves, hopefully they're the same, then you take them apart. So half the first prototypes, they get disassembled. I want to make sure they're building them all exactly the same. You do it again. So you take the fingerprint here, here, pre-production run, full production run. And then as you go into continuing manufacturing, you do a spot check on the line, you pull a couple of parts off the line, you're running through these four tests to make sure everything is meeting their specification. Got a new vendor, same thing, whoops. The new vendor has to build them the same way. They've got to meet the same curves, Qualifying a new vendor, I mean, it's, it's an intensive process. If purchasing, of course, always wants to do that, it's often more expensive that you want than you want. And of course, the poor first vendor who invested heavily in your R&D isn't very happy that he's got bumped out just for a cost. Aerospace work, I would do 100% test on these curves, quite honestly. It doesn't take more than a couple of minutes. You can automate it quite easily. So that's a, that's a good thing to do. And then when we work on a consulting project, I mentioned this earlier, we'll have a minimum of six transformers sent to us by our customers. So we'll measure the six transformers, three of them get taken apart. So I expect the measurements of all of them to be the same. And it's that one dB, 10% on the parts. And that's actually done here. So I'm gonna see some of your questions. Uh, not too many. Tell us how many points you box right now. It's overlay with pins. Of course, it's 200. The really important part of all these measurements is overlaying the curves on top of the predictions. That's where you get your design done by comparing these two together. Okay, so we have a set 200 points here. And we're going to have, you know, it'll basically be as many points as you want to, as you want to get on the um, on the box. Bah, 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 bah. Do we consider the skin depth of the primary and secondary? Yes, we do, but no, we didn't here. So when we do a primary winding, we say, okay, we want to fit that primary winding in two layers you can get a 31 gauge wire in there. And what we look at is what's what's the loss there? Well, it's less than a tenth of a watt. Here's your part. There's a tenth of a watt in there, okay. Sure, it's fine. We don't look at current density, current density with skin depth. 
Do we analyze skin depth? Yeah, absolutely. We click on this thing here. We solve Dell's equations for you. And we do the proximity loss for you. We find out what the loss multiply is in there. So we do the analysis of that. And then we even, we find the DC resistance. We find the AC resistance at the switching frequency for you. So we do a full in-depth analysis of um of windings and then we even go a little bit further we give you a curve of the ac resistance of the winding and if you want more than that we'll even give you a spice model of the ac resistance so our software goes in really deep um you can't consider all of this when you first choose the wire gauge it's just trying to lay it in the window that's how practical design works what about fitting it into but yeah, we go in depth after that. Yeah, do things. Lead acidic. And all five of these be the same set. Most had one layer. That is a change um leakage all the time becomes more important secondary to cut down important than get stops reverse re capacitance less okay. All right. I'm sorry some of you are complaining about the voice there. I think it's okay. But nothing's changed now. Physical setup. That's it. You need additional parts with our response analyzer. Let's go back to the presentation here. Take transformer measurements. But to learn more, we're using design software. Our designs of these magnetics. Okay, so give us an email if you want to see a full demo of that. We can certainly send that to you. Fast flight design workshops. We do this in person. People come to our workshops when they're allowed to come here again, that is, and they wind these transformers. They go through all these iterations, and we teach this methodology of taking the fingerprint of the transformer, and everybody goes home able to wind their own prototypes, and therefore greatly speed up their design process. Frequency response analyzers. Our top analyzer is the 800, which has been around. Keep a lot faster for and when it comes to loop gain, you know, nothing comes close. For you do, the gonna do a great job. Passive components, magnetic, you, you know, I think we've only one magnetics manufacturer, 300 more affordable for magnet no reason why you should balancing you know you get good if you want it fast you go for this you know good results as well ultimately linked with that important part because every and we put these Many of you I know, yep, I know it's questions about switching power suppliers on there. People come in with real problems, they get real world answers that help them with their design. And there's over 4,000 users, uh, use members of our Facebook group right now who interact with each other on a, on a regular basis. And free car mode book, if you want that, nothing to do with magnetics. And there's a whole bunch of articles. Some of you I see in the questions are asking about um, the uh, articles uh, on this to back it up. Yeah, you can look at Dow's equations. You could look at different ways to wind transformers. These three different variations of winding a transformer for a better resonant frequency and eliminating the dip. There's an article there in our Pasquay Design Center for you. Let's see. Estimate the leakage inductance. Well, 
That one's easy. Uh, leakage inductance is the same as an airflow inductor. It's one half Li, sorry, mu naught n squared a over L. So mu naught is mu naught, four pi 10 to the minus seven. N squared is the number of turns squared. A, we'll get to that in a minute. L is the length across the bobbin. A is the area between the primary and secondary winding. So you take the separation, multiply by the turn length, that gives you leakage inductance calculation. Go to our power supply design center articles and they will explain to you how to calculate leakages for your transformers. Okay. Uh, creepage, clearance, yes, of course. Um, as we go smaller and smaller transformers, you will have trouble turning a transformer this size into something that meets full IEC creepage and clearance. Um, I use triple insulated wire almost exclusively when I have to deal with that. Um, trying to put margin tape inside there, it just compromises the design so much and overcomplicates it. It's much better to use a triple insulated wire to, to isolate the primary and secondary. And then sometimes that means a custom bobbin to get the clearance when you come down to the board. But all these techniques, yeah, absolutely, we get involved in this, uh, you know, depending on what our customer needs. Some of them need, you know, 6 kV isolation. We, we uh, help them with that. But uh, triple insulated wire is definitely your friend. Make sure it's good triple insulated wire. There's some good stuff and then some not so good stuff. So look out for that too. And yep, you'll all notice uh, this is our Ridley box. We actually, this entire webinar is running off the Ridley box. There's a computer in here. It's running the webinar. It's running uh, Ridley works. It's running the frequency response analyzer part. There's a scope in there too. So this has evolved, not actually as a product originally to sell to anybody. This is our teaching box. We're now taking this on our road to teach our courses. And it's much more portable than our other method. And then, you know, when we run into the really troublesome, noisy cases, then, you know, the AP, of course, steps in and solves those easily. So, uh, for that. Uh, comes with RidleyWorks Lifetime License, Frequency Response Analyzer. What's really nice, by the way, it's a four channel analyzer, A, B, C, D. So, you can hook up to your control circuit, put probes in different places, and you can switch from control to output to compensator design to loop design without moving any probes which is kind of nice when you're debugging. You just hook up the probes one time and just change the input and output channels. So it's got the computer in there, it's got the, uh, the 200 mega scope in there, and these are the accessories you can get. So somebody asked, yeah, this is our impedance test kit. We only need one for measuring impedances of uh, magnetics. It'll measure down to one milliohm at the low end, on the low impedance, it'll measure as small a capacitance as one picofarad, which is quite remarkable when you consider the design of these input channels. But we set it up to measure as low as one picofarad, which is great for resolving uh, your magnetics for you. Okay, transforming production. Huh. <laughs> Somebody's asked, they have a transformer in production with supplier A. Can you use supplier B, use the same design, material, structure, winding, et cetera, to get a better price or lead time? Well, <laughs> that's up to your politics, of course, is part of it. So you will have worked with vendor A on developing this design. If the first thing you do is take his design and then try to offload it to somebody else for a lower price, you know, they're probably not gonna work with you quite as closely next time around. So you have to deal with that. Do you have to requalify? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. I mean, it depends on how strict your company is, but if somebody's changed that magnetic on you, you really need to go through the high pot test. You need to go through EMI again. Do people do that? I don't know. But that is the most critical component in terms of safety. So change vendors at your risk. You know, I, I unless you're saving an enormous amount of money, you know, don't change your magnetics vendor, certainly without engineering running through the full qualification of it. Okay, don't just let purchasing go at it. Okay, it's not fair to your vendors and it's not fair to what might happen. If you've established reliability with your vendor, 
you've got a million parts in the field and then you want to cost reduce for some small savings you, you, you'd be surprised how much it costs them when they start coming back from the field and I know many of you on our group have a lot of horror stories about changing vendors there so use your discretion of course we all look for lower prices but you have to take the full price you know equation into account you know cost cost of cost of recalls should never mention that word all things like that are very important and are they isolated inputs on that four channel scope no they're not so you just put an isolation probe on it no big deal and can we estimate the margin for core saturation in our tool absolutely so we go here and we look at the turns and the core here's our core which is an epc19 designing for 0.3 tesla that's where i design maximum flux density with this number of turns you can see here it wanted 90 turns we put in 86. if i reset that okay it will design right at 0.3 tesla okay if you start pushing the current limit in your converter then you will see the b max going beyond that. so we can have a lot of discussion about what b max should be if you're in commercial supply design, 0.3 Tesla is a rugged design. If you're in aerospace, they may use 0.25 Tesla or 0.2 Tesla, a rugged design. This is for a gap ferrite, of course. Okay. So the margin, you know, once you start eating into that, then you're at risk. This points out the floor of, you know, buying some of these off the shelf parts where they won't tell you how many turns they have. If I don't know the turns count and I know the core, I can't tell you what the maximum flux is. That's what really worries me about this modern trend of not letting anybody know the turns count. If, if you don't know the turns count, you haven't done a worst case analysis on your design, period. You just haven't done it. That belongs with you as the power supply designer. It doesn't belong with the vendor. You can't, you know, they don't own the circuit design, you do. When products come back from the field, you own the problem, not them. Okay, so you need to dig into that B max. You know, are you okay for where you've got your current limit set, your worst case current limit? That's up to you. But yes, it's in our tool. If you don't want to use that value of 0.3, you want to take it down to 0.25 to be more like aerospace. Hey, you've got to use 108 turns in here instead. Okay, very easy. Is there a simple winding diagram for each transformer? Uh, <laughs> There is, but I haven't drawn it yet. Um, these were wound yesterday, literally, getting ready for this uh, this seminar. I wanted to get things all the same, so I wasn't comparing apples and oranges. And if you look in our design center, you will find this case of the three different windings, one that's out and back, one that's out and back with tape, and then one that is segment wound. So you will find that in one of our papers. And these are all things that have happened to me, by the way. I'm not just making these up to be, you know, academic about it. Uh, we've given a manufacturer a design, said, hey, we want the wind to go across the bobbin, then we want two layers of tape, and then they want to come back. They took that design to vendor B, who said, yeah, you know, putting that tape in, it's a real pain. We have to stop the winder, we have to put the winder, the wire over there, put the tape on, bring it back again, cost money. They took the tape out. When did it show up? It showed up when our flyback supply would not start. There was so much capacitance in there, big spike, tripped the current limit, nothing was working. It showed up also in the measurements of the impedance. So we could have caught it, you know, well, I, I wasn't involved anymore. These were starting to fail a year after I was involved in the project. Somebody had changed vendors or the vendor had pulled the tape out of it. So this is a difficult problem to manage because somebody's got to make sure that tape's in there. And the only way to guarantee it is to take it apart and see if it's in there, put it back together again. I don't know. Take the fingerprint. That tells you, yeah, that tape's still in there. And you do these spot checks years later, and you keep saying, yeah, it's being built the right way. It's being built the right way. And of course, this ties into should you change vendors? Well, that's more of that risk there as well. Grinding versus sheets in terms of gapping a core. 
Okay, well, that's an interesting question. When you're in production, most people grind the center leg down to open up to the right AL value. When we're in the lab or I'm doing prototypes, I'm putting in a little piece of gapping material. That can be as simple as a piece of paper when you're going fast. It can be precision Nomex when you're getting ready for production. So gapping with material is for the prototypes, actually gapping the core is for production, unless you're really sensitive to shock and vibration. If you gap the center leg, then the core structure is actually weaker. So, so gapping with the material can be stronger for some of the aerospace applications. So that's a, that's a good question as well. De -de -de -de. Key checks and parameters on inductors. Well, somebody listed here, you mentioned the inductance, the resonance, DCR, and saturation. Sweep the curve. Please sweep the curve. Don't just give me the resonance. I want to see anything strange going on there. Okay. So I like to see that full curve sweep on an inductor. They're less interesting because it's one winding. But if they've changed, you know, the layering of the winding, some of these little drum coils you get, they might layer it one way this, this day, and then they're going to layer it another way, you know, later on in the production process. So sweep the curve. You will see that on the, on the inductors. So that's good. Uh, the reason for the second resonance, that's a good question. And where were we? PowerPoint. Second resonance right here. Okay, so the first resonance is a parallel resonance, that's a peak. So it's magnetizing inductance with a capacitor in parallel with it. The only way to get a dip is a series resonance. So what that actually is, it's the leakage to the core, which is a strange parameter. It's what the air core would be. Not, not quite the air core. The <laughs> hard to explain without diagrams, but it's it's a leakage element resonating with another capacitance. Okay, and that capacitance is related to the primary primer. So another way to look at this, if you see here, this red curve has a peak and a dip and a peak and another dip coming along. And if you kept plotting it, you'd see a lot of peaks and dips. So, and if you remember from RF work, if you did any of this, that's the characteristics of a transmission line. They have infinite number of inductors, capacitor, inductor, capacitor throughout the process. So we're hitting the transmission line effect of this primary winding here. And there's the first dip coming along on that. It's not part of your classic transform a circuit model. They won't so show that leakage capacitance that's causing the dip in the transform circuit model. So you have to get much more sophisticated in your modeling. Or better, wind a transformer that doesn't dip on you. And then you don't have to worry about it. You can see even it's on yellow and green one here, they do kind of have a little dip here. But because of the way they're wound, it's not significant in there. So there's another little LC going on there with that one. So you can get as sophisticated as you like in the modeling of these uh, transformers. And uh, all these little things make a difference. That's, that's really the point of this presentation is that intricate details of the transformer are make and break in your performance of your, you know, large and expensive systems. Okay. For managers out there, please stop focusing on pennies, especially in the magnetics. I know you all hate the magnetics. They cost too much. They hand wound. You don't have control of it. Get control of it. Pay a little more for a better magnetic because that's your entire system. Okay, it's not a lot of technology in this. You know, everybody knows this is 200 years old, but the know-how inside that magnetic is is not worth skimping on on those parts. You know, when you realize these kind of differences are going to show up when you start doing that kind of thing. Which window utilization do I recommend? I don't care. As long as it fits in the window, I'm happy. As long as my core isn't uh, isn't too big, that's it. So if you read the old magnetics textbooks, they love to talk about window utilization and full window and all the rest of it. I don't care. I don't know what my window utilization is. On this one here, there's a fair amount of window left there. I don't know if you can see the light coming through there. Maybe it's 50%. 
if it works, if the core fits, it's a good price core, great. I may have a transformer that's a 20% window utilization. In the old days, it matters. And the old days meant 60 hertz transformer with hundreds and hundreds of turns and a square window, and you had to fill it up to get the power through it. Nowadays, we have, you know, sometimes 10 turns on a primary and secondary. Windows have changed. They're not square anymore. They get skinnier and skinnier. Okay, because people are just aren't using the window. But don't don't worry about window. Don't. Here's a great big transformer. Okay, they've crammed some foil into this one. So they've got actually 60, 70% on the window utilization here. But uh, it's it's not something to really worry about. It really, it really isn't. That's not a design parameter that's needed anymore. Any more than current density in the wire. I've been building transformers for 40 years. I've never known what my wire current density is. And it's a meaningless parameter. I do know what the temperature of my wire is. But once you get start getting into proximity loss, nobody knows what the current density is in any particular point of the wire. It's just, you know, is it getting too hot? Is it being cooled? Okay. I think we've recovered most of these. Um, you're all welcome, please. So come join our Facebook group and we can continue the discussion on there. Happy to answer any uh, detailed questions on this. Um, we are planning on doing a whole bunch of these uh, training seminars. I love doing this stuff. Uh, it's a little difficult and then there's not much feedback from anybody because I can't see you. But I can see all your questions, and if you like what we did, please send us an email, send us a message. We'd like to hear good things. Engineers are fairly notorious, and I'm one of these two. It's like, if you make a mistake, they let you know right away. If you've done a good job, we don't tend to hear much. So I, I take silence as being a good job. But uh, tell us what you liked. Tell us uh, what other topics you'd like to see. This, I, I know I've gone fast here. This is just scratching the surface of magnetics. Uh, we spend eight hours on this when we do our in-person courses and then we spend another eight hours in the lab with people actually winding them. So theory is great, equations are great, but until you put that wire down on the bobbin you don't know anything about magnetics because that's when you actually start to get it. You know, you push down hard on the wire, you bend the wire, your fingers bleed and you make it work and you melt the bob in and then you start learning all about materials and what's a windable transformer, what's not a windable transformer. So this is a hugely, hugely valuable skill for every power electronics person to know. If you don't control the magnetics and own the magnetics completely, then you're out of control of your power supply, quite honestly. You, you have to know every every detail here. And we will make a recording of this that will be up there in a few days so you can all go watch that and um I'd like to thank you all for your attendance today and uh we'll let you know when we're running another of these sessions and please please give us some feedback on what topics very specific topics you would like to see for the future we have so much material i just i, I just can't tell anymore what, what people really really need in their design lives but, you know, we're all about speeding up your design, helping you with the design. Uh, if you'd like to get our software, that will move you along hugely in magnetics design. You know, we write the software really for ourselves in our own consulting to, to generate designs very, very quickly. And we use it in our courses. And once you get there, you'll find out what an easy process this is of designing the magnetics. Now, the last step of the layering of the windings, that's the bit you got to learn. But at least get the core and the turns and the wire size right to start with. And then you start digging into the real learning of these subtle differences that make a big difference in magnetics design. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. Hope you're all staying safe and uh, okay where you are. And we will see you in a few weeks from now. I think about three more weeks, we'll have another topic. Um, according to your choices. So send us your feedback, what you'd like to hear about, and then we will respond to that. Thanks so much for attending. Uh, goodbye. I don't know how to stop the broadcast. <laughs>